Thank you. Uh, normally, I just uh, give workshops around the libraries that I contribute to or uh, something else related to machine learning. But uh, today, it's a bit of an emotional talk uh, because of the topic, as you can see. So I was introduced very well, so I'm going to move on uh, to the next slide. Um, so uh, in February, there was a very big earthquake uh, that had a magnitude of 7.8. And uh, it, it was in the southeastern Turkey and uh, I think north of Syria. And uh, many lives were uh, just um, ruined that day. And uh, in, um, in, in like few days, there was like 40,000 um, 40, million, uh, 40,000 uh, people died and uh, so many were injured in just few days. And uh, at the end, uh, it was like an area as big as Germany and uh, 16 million people were affected because of it. Like an entire, some of the cities were completely just uh, destroyed because of it. And what happened? So that day, uh, we, we saw that there's a common pattern with the survivors. Survivors are posting uh, a writing of uh, a screenshot and posting it on Instagram saying, hey, I'm, I'm here, this is my address, can you come and rescue me? And then they take the screenshot of that writing and then they post it or they, they try to send messages to their uh, relatives. And um, they also post uh, to Twitter or there are several Telegram channels that take these uh, take these notifications. And uh, we were a bunch of uh, voluntary hackers. Uh, we were in a Discord group and we were like, there is this survivor guilt that you need to do something about it. And uh, it's, um, we, we, we just tried to come up with ways that uh, we could somehow make use of this data and uh, actually rescue people because it would get lost and like, the area was like so big, um, the, 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 the civilians had to help a lot. There was a very big voluntary effort. So we were like, how can we contribute to this? And um, we were first asked to build an OCR application. If you don't know, OCR is optical character recognition. And what it essentially does is that you have like a, uh, type text or handwritten text uh, in an image and you can extract the text that is inside it and just uh, pass it. So your input is a screenshot uh, of uh, writing and your output is the text. And uh, this, um, this application should return the parsed address, not not exactly the text, but the parsed version of it into streets, apartment number, and more. So we built one uh, initially, and this is how it looked like. So you would, you would in here, you would input the uh, screenshot, and uh, you could get directly the, the parsed address, or you could also input the text, if you wish, and then you could get the the address, so we could actually crowdsource this data collection. Or, um, because this UI can be used as an API, you could send a batch request to get your addresses parsed, and this was, this was used a lot, like you could actually send a request with the screenshot, the, uh, it's base64 encoded, or you could send the text directly and you would get the parsed address if you want to. And uh, for OCR, we tried many libraries. We tried Pedal OCR, Easy OCR, and Tesseract. But at the end, we decided to go with Easy OCR because of some of the characters uh, not being parsed properly. And this, this whole address parsing is called named entity recognition. And you can parse streets, apartments, and so on. You can get the names with named entity recognition. This is actually the abstracted name of the problem that we were solving. 
And initially we used uh, OpenAI API, but we easily ran out of credit, so this application would crash a lot. And uh, we later decided to train our model. And um, which brings me to today's talk, which is about the disaster map application that we have developed. So disaster map is essentially a front end uh, with, um, uh, with uh, points or data points on it visualized uh, on the addresses and uh, you can filter what people need and uh, you can just go to the data points which are matched with the longitude and the latitude of the person posting the tweet or something and you can provide them with uh, what they need. And this was the amount of uh, the tra the amount of traffic it got in uh, in only one month. Uh, it was used a lot, and uh, we have received so many messages that people were actually saved thanks to this application. And um, what was happening was that uh, we were first uh, asked. Uh, to make a meaning, like a dis distill the tweets uh, and messages into following information. Uh, owners, post owners needs, post owners address, but in a structured manner so we can pass to the Google's uh, GIS API. And the uh, post owners name and phone number. So the, there was a couple of problems with this. So because we are a bunch of hackers, um, there was a problem around the anonymization and storing the tweets. We later learned that even getting these, these information and putting it inside a plain CSV is actually processing it, like uh, just collecting the tweets. And this might be in breach of you know, GDPR and so on. And uh, there was many challenges around the data drift as well, which I will uh, later come today. So before I move on to that, I would like to uh, explain uh, our methodology a bit. So in here, uh, we, have, we have solved mainly natural language understanding problems. Um, and uh, in natural language understanding, where you are doing text classification, token classification, what you want, and not generation like GPT stuff. Um, the state of the art is the transformers and transfer learning. Transformer is the architecture. And transfer learning is to transfer information from a very big pre-trained uh, pre model. So you can imagine, for instance, GPT, GPTs are very big models or like there is, for computer vision, there is ResNet and other things. Um, you can have that pre-trained model and then you can just adapt that model to uh, be useful in your own use case. And this is called fine tuning. And this is currently the state of the art. I will explain the, how it's done later on, but um, we directly picked uh, transfer, transfer learning for this use case. And it's, we also later uh, compared it to NXG boost um, trained from scratch and it was again outperforming it. We also um, compared it to OpenAI's API um, for generation, but it was like a cons cons restricted generation and it was again outperforming it because we were actually um, fine tuning a model for our use case. So this is the BERT model. In case you don't know BERT model, it's, it's the biggest, uh, one of the biggest uh, changes in the paradigm of natural language processing. So today's models like uh, GPT, Llama, and others are originating from the transformers architecture. And this is one of the first transformers architectures used for natural language processing. And um, can I just move? Yeah. So. Uh, what you can do with BERT is that, and this was released by Google back in the day, what you can do with BERT is that you have this pre-trained model and uh, you put a, a classifier head on top of it and it can be about 
text classification, for instance, and if you have a text classification, um, if you want to train for text classification with three outputs, you just put a classifier layer on top of it with uh, three out, uh, three, uh, three nodes, and then you can just train that part, and you will be transferring the knowledge you have from BERT um, to your use case. So you only train the classifier layer, or you can also uh, unfreeze the previous layers. It's up to you, but it only takes three minutes on, um, I think we used uh, T4, uh, T4 uh, GPU. Uh, three minutes on T4, so it's very simple. And um, yeah, that's why we picked this. And on top of this, this also comes with positional embeddings which improve the performance. Um, that's why I think it performed way better than um, XGBoost or any other architecture. And Transformers is the library uh, that makes a lot of abstractions over um, the whole transfer learning process because it's actually <laughs> quite a handful, but uh, you can just um, you can just abstract things away thanks to transformers and like it takes very little change in the code um, if you would like to use it. Um, the, it has uh, something called trainer API which you can uh, directly pass your data and some hyperparameters and fine tune a model and it will just work fine. So initially for intent classification, we were asked to do intent classification so that we can classify shelter, food, water, and more. Uh, we have used something called um, um, natural language inference models. Uh, and essentially what it does is that it does zero shot text classification. And zero shot means you haven't trained this model specifically for text classification, but you provide the text itself and the candidate labels. It can be like shelter, food, um, water, and then it will just return in here, you can see, I think, it will uh, return the class probabilities of what this text might be. So it's like a large model that you can use uh, out of the box without training. That's why uh, we first opted for this. And this was performing as good as uh, GPT-like models. And this is completely open source, by the way. And. Um, yeah, like uh, for intent classification later, the model that we trained, also this one is a BERT-like model. It's an, it's, uh, the architecture is the same. It's called encoder-only models, but um, it's a BERT variant. And for address parsing, we tried the GPT-3, but uh, again, it's, we re-ran out of it. And uh, it would occasionally return wrong results and uh, confuse uh, named entities. Like you can have like an apartment name with a person's name, and it would confuse it. But if you are to train, like it's it's often that my intuition is that, and what I observed was that uh, you shouldn't use um, large generative language models on uh, understanding tasks. It's like, it's like cutting the bread with a katana. It's too overkill and you don't need that. You can actually just train your models in like three, three minutes and it will eventually outperform uh, that case where you are paying a lot of money and the inference is not as uh, bad. Uh, and the thing is like uh, we, alongside with the named entity recognition model, that were parsing the address and the names that I just talked about. We used regex, uh, and uh, it, it's, it's, it's very often that the simpler solutions actually result better. And uh, how we work together, uh, so basically Hugging Face Hub is uh, like the GitHub of machine learning in a way. It has repositories specifically made for machine learning and like it also has collaborative features like uh, pull requests and so on. So it was easier to work on that and like people could try our models right away. And uh, this also later helped us uh, uh, 
uh, with the inference part because the inference um, for inference it would take a lot of work, which I will explain later. So this is the first open source address parsing model that we have trained. So in here, you can see the inference widget and uh, it parses the the streets, the apartment, the the municipality and everything. And, uh, thank, and then we have passed this output. Uh, we processed and parsed this output uh, and passed it to the Google's GIS API. And then later, uh, it, re it would return um, uh, longitude and latitude. And that would be marked on the, um, on the map directly. And this was our multi-label intent classification model. Uh, the, the thing is, people might state uh, multiple needs in one place. Like it can be, I need blanket and shelter and food. So you don't really classify into you know, one class. Uh, so we had to train uh, multi-label intent classification. And um, yeah, there was a very small change uh, compared to text classification. So, um. And for model serving, we used the inference API of Hugging Face because the thing is like, if we were to get the model itself, uh, we, to make it usable, we would have to dockerize it and then put it to a cloud instance and so on. And we were racing with time, so it, this was very convenient because once you push the model to Hugging Face Hub, this is automatically enabled. And uh, thanks to this, uh, we gained a lot of time and uh, we could swap the models very quickly in the production. And they charge um, per, uh, per token, as far as I remember back in the day. So it's not, it wasn't much at all. And um, the problem was that after these model was deployed, these models were deployed. The problem was that there was a lot of data drift. So what was happening was that um, as the time passes, uh, like the, the effects of the earthquakes actually stayed for one month or something. As the time passes. Uh, people's needs were changing a lot. Like in the first week, you would act, people would ask to be rescued under the building. And then in the second week, you would have people asking for shelter and food because it was very cold over there. And like even if people were rescued, they would actually freeze to death or they, were, they couldn't find water and uh, food. And that was, that was quite a problem. And later on, this evolved into sanitary needs of people and other things. So the tweets and the posts and the messages that we were receiving were constantly evolving. And it wasn't, um, it, 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 it was a challenging task. And um, the prob another problem was that um, we weren't allowed to see the data that was coming to coming uh, from production. They just weren't going to store it uh, for privacy reasons. And because of this, um, also like they were on us, like um, they were saying that we need to remove our data or anonymize it and store that instead of keeping it because in this data you have phone numbers, names of people, addresses, which is unimaginable within EU, but acceptable within Turkey. <laughs> and, um, and for this, uh, we used the Faker library to anonymize and store the data without hurting the model performance. And um, for the, for the uh, parts where we would have to adapt to the data drift, um, we would uh, have to crowdsource this process so people, um, like we have the tweets with the timestamps and everything, so we built a UI using Argila and Gradio. Gradio is like Streamlit if you are using Streamlit. It's like you are building a UI for your machine learning model. And um, we had like multiple of these, but this one, for instance, you input the data and then it's in the backend, there is a model that uh, classifies uh, the 
the addresses, and then you can say, hey, this is, this is true, this is false, or this is ambiguous, and then it drops to a database uh, where we collect uh, the where we collect the incorrect stuff and we can later adapt our model. And uh, this was hosted open to everyone, so everyone could contribute to, the, um, to, to this. But the problem is that data labeling itself is very hard. Like, I remember um, we got a very big generous grant from Microsoft Asia of 150,000 I don't know the currency, I think it was in dollars. And uh, we also use this for labeling and everything. And the initial, initial thing, we, initial data set that we labeled was very bad because there is a rush and everything and the, the guidelines weren't as clear. And um, if you don't really have this, then you cannot come up with a standardized thing. And in labeling, in data labeling, what you should do is like, you should have people approving things approving the labeled data and like it's, if it passes from like six people or something, then it goes on to your data set. And we didn't have time for that. That was very awful. And um, yeah, uh, after a while, we have improved our data set as well because we had clearer guidelines and everything. But then, you know, as you race with the time, the problem is that you begin with the people being rescued from wreckages, and then um, and then uh, you need to first get them, and um, that that is where you need to race the hardest with the time, and then the importance decreases eventually. And that was the problem with the labeling and everything. And uh, thanks to the Hugging Face repositories, uh, we were able to host uh, TensorBoard instances. And uh, we also had uh, built a leaderboard for the, the, for the models because multiple people were training models. It's like a very big team effort. Um, we ev evaluated them and then uh, we would write into the model repositories themselves so it would automatically get the leaderboard would automatically get them and then just uh, rank them. So we would use the best model that was available. And uh, in here we cared about recall uh, for the multi-label intent uh, because uh, you would, you, you, you should be caring about false, uh, false, posit false negatives more because uh, if a person has a need and if you are not attending to it, then this is a problem. That's why we opted for recall and F1 score. And so it was the completely open source MLOps pipeline. So we would clean and version the data and then uh, experiment uh, using transformers and version our models on Hugging Face Hub and do active learning. Um, there were a bunch of other machine learning projects as well. Um, this one is determining road and building damage with remote sensing. And uh, this is about the fact that like the buildings were crashed and the roads were completely, some of them were completely useless. And because of this, so many, um, like even if you were to deliver help over there, you wouldn't be able to do that because that road is just cracked and uh, it wasn't usable. So we had a bunch of computer vision engineers that uh, developed a model to do segmentation over the buildings and the roads and uh, others so that uh, we could inform the authorities that you know this road is useless and uh, you should opt for another one. And this was pretty cool application. And uh, this is my significant other's blog. Uh, he led the front end part. And uh, if you would like to read about the front end, the back end, and the other challenges about this process, you can go to his uh, DevTo profile. And uh, people are still struggling, unfortunately, ever since they are homes were lost, some of them were never able to move to another place, and some of them are still living with shelters and 
still, they still need food and water, so you can uh, donate at uh, ahbab.org. And I can take questions now. It's a bit earlier, I'm sorry, but uh, I guess it works. <laughs> So thank you very much for the talk. Uh, if there's questions, you could raise a hand and then go up to the microphone and ask them. Let's have a quick look. Yes, please stand up and go to the microphone. Thank you. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I have a question. Um, I don't know if you already heard maybe about initiatives like um, maybe not for only for Tur uh, Turkey or other seismically active uh, regions. Uh, the, maybe it will, can be um, useful to have an, an application. Uh, when I was listening to you, I was thinking about uh, a kind of lack of an application where you, you can just press a button and specify your, your needs and stuff like that. And uh, then it's going to be sent to, to authorities. And uh, I don't know if you if you already start, maybe in, in, um, at government uh, side or maybe some private initiatives. If yeah. you start thinking about uh, creating some kind of application, I agree like that. that will be very useful. But like the problem was that the fact that this didn't exist at all. You know, like there is a need to actually build something. Why would we need to build something? Why? Like, there are so many critics, actually, why the buildings weren't properly audited, you know? Some of the buildings were not as good, and that's why they crumbled. And um, there is so many questions, and uh, what you say makes sense, and uh, I will just forward it to the Discord server uh, that uh, we developed this on. And we later on, we also developed stuff for... Um, the voting processes in Turkey uh, with OCR and everything. Um, and uh, this Discord is still active, so we might do something like that. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? Um, yeah, I, oh, it's loud. Uh, thanks for the inspirational talk. Uh, really shows you what even a small group, or rather a small group of hackers can, can accomplish. Um, I have a non-technical question. What did, after you uh, gained the information, we got um, information what the people needed, um, how did you actually help get the um, food or shelter or water to uh, them? So this, this, is the, this is the map, and like anyone can actually go to that website and uh, see the address and the need, and uh, it's more to reflect this... Uh, reflect this information and uh, we have heard that uh, people actually went through this website and uh, rescued other people and uh, so they basically see the address and see the need and just go and just uh but those were m mainly private persons helping each other not like uh, the military or other authorities but it was uh, so people. it was it was an so NGOs were using it, civilians were using it, uh, later government were, was like, yeah, we can use this, but uh, what about the data? Mm. What about the privacy? <laughs> and um, yeah, like uh, the, the main search and rescue teams of Turkey were using it. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Another question, please? Thanks for the talk. Uh, I have uh, more of a technical question. Okay. Uh, you mentioned uh, in your talk uh, fine-tuning uh, all these language models. And uh, I'm just curious, how much data would you need to fine-tune a model? I guess the answer is it, it depends. <laughs> it uh, depends. But uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe you could answer uh, uh, by maybe talking about some factors that are important to consider, for example, in the case of classification. A uh, cool question. Uh, essentially, the thing with the transfer learning is that uh, you you do not need that much data anymore because you already have the features extracted. You can only um, focus on the data specific things. I would say um, the data quality should be better, and uh, you don't need as much data. I would say like maybe like. 
5,000 samples or something should be enough. It really depends on your model size. If you have something like bird-like model, bird-like models are often very small. Even if you have like something like distilled birds, which is like a smaller version of bird, uh, you need uh, you, you don't you just don't need that much. But if you are going to uh, for instance, uh, do a generative have a ge if you if you are um, fine tuning a generative model maybe T5 or something like that. I think you would need uh, more data for classification. You don't need as much because it's a very simple problem to solve compared to generation where it's a bit tricky. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I also work at Hugging Face, by the way, if you have like Hugging Face related questions or transformers or um, transfer learning related questions you can ask. Any other questions? Seeing none. Okay, at this point I see no other questions, but there's one. Will you be around tomorrow for the rest of the conference if other people want to talk to you? Yeah, of course. So then you can just uh, look for her tomorrow around the conference. And again, check the schedule, which has the information also about your blog. Yeah, so thank you. if you want to know more, just uh, look there. So let's have another round of applause from us. Thanks for the talk. Thank you.